All right, let's pick it back up with the number seven. And of course, seven is the number of completion. Uh, seven, it means it's, it's done, it's finished, and you start over, you can rest, whatever the case may be. Back in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and what is God doing the seventh day? He finished all His work, and so He rests. Amen? In uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended His work, which He had made, and He rested on the seventh day from all the work which He had made. So when God creates the Sabbath for that Jew, He, he says that's the seventh day. That's going to be the day of rest. That means the week is over, it's complete, it's finished, and now you can start afresh. And of course, we know that in 7,000 years is going to be the completion of the human race on this earth. One day is with the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. And the context and reference of that in Second Peter chapter 2 is very simply from the beginning to the end. And he says in the middle of that thing, Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. So you've got 7,000 years of human history on the earth. Uh, you got seven holes in your face. you got seven things that protrude off of the trunk of your body, male or female. You've got seven notes of music. There are seven feasts. There's the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven churches and the seven plagues or vials in the book of Revelation. And then it'll be finished. Amen? God says the, the mystery will be finished at that time. There's seven continents. There's the seven mysteries. We just studied the seven judgments. You'll, think that, you'll find that thing over and over again, seven, seven, and then you're done. Count up to seven, and you start over again. So, seven is completion. So, in Genesis chapter 7, God is finished. He has completed everything necessary. And so, He sends the flood to finish man and start over again. Amen? And when He does it, the last preaching recorded in the Bible before the flood comes is from Enoch the seventh from Adam Amen and uh, he's, he's, he's preaching that they're ungodly and he's preaching apostasy and he's preaching they need to get right and, and all that's what he's preaching over there in the book of Jude you'll find that alright so uh, seven is the, is the number of completion it's finished number eight of course then is the number of new beginnings there are seven notes in music it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and it starts over. The eighth note is an octave up. It's a new beginning. So you'll find eight in the Bible is, this, is the number of something new. So it was Noah plus seven for a total of eight that went on the ark. Amen. And so in Genesis chapter eight, you find a, a new world with Noah stepping out of the ark into that New world. Look in Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 12. He that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. How old was that male to be when he was circumcised? A new beginning. See? And so eight in your Bible is, is a picture of that new beginning, a new start. You're waiting until... The end of the week is over. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, and then it starts again. It goes to the eighth day. It goes an octave up and you start all over again with the same thing. And uh, that's, that's how those things go. See, it's, uh, eight is the, uh, the number of new beginnings, the number of something new. Look with me in 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel 17. Notice with me, please, in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 12. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons. And the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul, who is David, verse 14, the youngest of eight. He's the eighth. There's going to be a new beginning for Israel under the right king. 
Who's it going to be? It's going to be David. He's the eighth. It's an octave up. It's something new. Matthew chapter 8 is the first Gentile that receives a miracle from Jesus Christ. He's the centurion. He's a Roman soldier. And it is in Matthew chapter 8 where you find that centurion um, receiving a miracle from the Lord Jesus Christ. You come over to the book of Acts. You've got Acts chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. God's dealing with the nation of Israel only. After Acts chapter 7, there's a final rejection. They stone Stephen, who's calling upon the Lord. And what happens? God says, fine, I'll go a different way. And in Acts chapter 8, Philip comes by to an Ethiopian eunuch and preaches unto him salvation by grace through faith. And the first person other than a Jew to get into the church occurs in Acts chapter 8. Eight is the number of something new in the Bible. All right, number nine. Number nine in the Bible, real simply, is the number of fruitfulness. That's the number of fruitfulness in the Bible. Abraham was 99 and Sarah was 90 when they finally had that promised child. Uh, and so a woman, when she's pregnant, is pregnant usually for how long? Nine months. Look with me in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Look in Galatians 5. Look at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. There is the fruit of the Spirit. How many fruits are there? You know how many different fruits are mentioned in your Bible? Nine. There's apple. There's the fig. There's the grape. Um, there's the pomegranate. There's the date. Uh, there's sycamore. No, it's not a fruit. That's an um, olive. Thank you. Uh, oh boy, I'm missing a couple. I can't. You're not coming to me right now. No. No. Um. But there's there's two more. I, I got them written down. I don't think I wrote them in my Bible, though, did I? Maybe I did. Hold on just a second in case I did. Yeah. Uh -huh. now, I know I got it written down. I just don't know where. <laughs> if it's not in my Bible, then I got it written down on something in my office at the house. But I, but I did write them down. There's actually seven, a total of seven fruits you'll find mentioned in the Bible. Or uh, nine, I'm sorry. Nine fruits mentioned in the Bible just happens to be the number of fruitfulness in the Bible. Probably just another coincidence there. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to get fruit, it's, uh, we, we find uh, the fruit of the Holy Spirit mentioned where? In the book of Galatians, which just happens to be the ninth book of the New Testament. Of course, the New Testament is where you're going to find that fruitfulness from the Holy Spirit. And of course, the New Testament has nine, nine, nine books or 27 books. Amen? So there's where the fruit comes from. It comes from the number nine. Uh, Holy Ghost has how many letters? All right. King James has how many letters? Holy Bible has how many letters? Nine, nine. Sixteen, eleven. One plus six plus one plus one is what? Nine, nine, nine. Run in front of your Bible. You ought to have known it was the number of fruitfulness then, right? That's where the fruit comes from. Fruits, uh, the, the number of fruit in the Bible is nine. All right, how about ten? Ten in the Bible is the number of the Gentiles. Okay. When God's dealing with Israel, you're going to find with Israel it's twelve, but with the Gentiles it's ten. That's why as Gentiles we count to ten and start over. God counts to seven and starts over. We count to ten and start over. You occupied with the child's... Uh, never mind. I'm just giving you a hard time. Genesis chapter ten. You know I try to never miss an opportunity. 
Genesis chapter 10. Oh, look who shows up in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 5. The Gentiles show up. Where do they show up? They show up in Genesis chapter 10. That's when you find your Gentiles showing up in the Bible. Say, why? Well, there weren't any Gentiles before the flood. There wasn't any such thing. The, the Gentiles come after Noah. Amen. You don't have any Jews before the flood. You don't have any of that. It's after the flood when all that stuff starts. See, That's where your races and everything come from right there. It's, a, it's after the flood. Say again? Yeah. yeah. Amen. Well, yeah, probably something to that, huh? I wouldn't doubt it. All right, so uh, 10 in your Bible, the number for the Gentiles. Um, look in verse... Uh, where do I have here? Um, verse... Uh, oh, the, the ten kings of the Antichrist. There just happens to be ten. You guess what nations they're from. You see? And that's, that's the thing there. Is, is ten is always associated in your Bible with, with the Gentiles. Uh, Acts chapter 10. And listen, in all these, I could give more examples of any of these numbers... I don't want us to be here more than one week doing it. I'm trying to get through it in one week just to... I want to just kind of lay a little foundation so you have something with some verses to go by. Uh, but as you study the Bible on your own and as you're reading the Bible, these may be some interesting things that help you out as God may give you some light upon the Scriptures on something. Look in Acts chapter 10. Oh, guess what happens in Acts chapter 10? The door to the Gentiles is opened. Peter is sent and uh, preaches the word there to Cornelius and all his house, and they're saved by grace through faith. God reaches that Gentile when? He does it in Acts chapter 10. The number of the Gentiles in the Bible, look at verse 45. And they of the circumcision, which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. When did the Gentiles get the Holy Ghost? In Acts chapter 10, the number of the Gentiles. All right, um, number 11 in your Bible, that's the number of earth. Uh, look in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Say, wouldn't that be the number 1? Well, 1 and 1 is 11. It depends on how you look at it. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So, uh, uh, there you have it for that. Verse 11. Now, we'll look at 11. Verse 11. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass. You see that? There's the earth. Look in chapter 11. Verse 1. Eleven one, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. See the word earth showing up right there. It's in chapter eleven, verse one, and uh, you'll you'll see that thing uh, many times throughout the Bible. You'll notice that. Uh, look back in chapter six of Genesis, verse eleven, Genesis six eleven. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Okay. So, 11 and uh, the earth, there's a, there's a connection right there. Look in Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 1. Was it verse 1? Yeah, verse 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. All right, I don't even know why that's there. Oh, it says in verse, it's probably verse 10 is what it is. And they that dwell on the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry. Okay, that's, that's probably what I, was, what I was looking for right there. Um, look down there in verse... Um, 
Verse 18. Verse 18. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and the saints, to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Who's that? That's the environmentalists. All those environmentalists are out there destroying the earth. Amen. All right. You're welcome. All right, so Jesus Christ, who was the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the three in one, was on the earth three times eleven, thirty three years. Probably nothing, but that's interesting. Uh, look in Deuteronomy chapter 1. God is promising to that Jew physical promises. And the ultimate promise and where the whole thing is going to end up is, is the whole earth. But notice what he's doing here. He's he's he divided the sea to take it through, and he's going to give them earth for uh, their reward. Verse two: There are eleven days' journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea, which means if they had just walked straight there, it would have taken eleven days to get to the Promised Land, right? How long did it end up taking them? Yeah, most of them never made it, and those that did, it took forty years. That's like a lot of Christians. Basically, what God's saying is. You could get to the point where you need to be in your Christian life if you had absolute and complete and total obedience in 11 days. But it's going to take you four years because you're a rebellion. Well, look at verse 3. It came to pass in the 40th year in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spake unto the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him, commandment unto them, and so on and so forth, and they grown and, and taken that earth, taken that land. All right, uh, this one should be pretty pretty obvious to you, but 12 in the Bible is the number of Israel. Right? You have 12 tribes to the nation of Israel. Uh, when Christ comes to him, he calls out 12 disciples who later become the 12 apostles. Okay? Uh, you take a musical note, it goes up to 12. Brother Ray, you just told me it goes up to 7 and starts over. I know that, but you got half notes. Those black notes, so if you take those seven and then those five black notes, you actually have a total of 12 notes in music in a scale before it starts over. So you could say seven, you could say 12. Or you could just make a chord with three. Three, seven, twelve. If somebody was really good at mathematics, I bet you they could figure some things out about the Bible. It was Albert Einstein that said one time, uh, he was a great atheist, of course, and and uh, he said, uh, I can't believe in a God that's not a mathematical equation. Well, that's too bad for Albert Einstein because if he had gotten saved and gotten his Bible, he might have been able to figure some stuff out. Okay? Uh, when you start putting all this stuff, it's wild, man. You start looking at those number combinations and there's certain ones that fit together and there's others that don't, but they fit with other numbers. If you can figure that out and find their sequences and stuff in the Bible, you know what you've got here, right? You understand what this is? It's the book of life. You want the genetic marker for life? It's found in there. I guarantee it. I don't know how to find it. But I guarantee a great mathematician could. If he knew his Bible well enough and knew those numbers, he'd get it. He'd figure it out. You take that 3, 7, 12, he'd come up with something right there. He sure would. You take 6 and 13 and 5, he'd come up with something there. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You take... Um, you know, Three and nine, you might come up with something. Okay, Eric? Have you ever heard of a group that constructed uh, a number for every letter? Uh-uh. Really? They sign up for the Uh-huh. I never heard of that, but that's a, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't mind checking that out if there's a book or something. Nothing weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 But it only works on the King James Bible. Huh? Yeah, that might just be a coincidence. 
There's 12 constellations. You get up there, there's 12 of them. It's divided into 12. There's 12 hours in a day. You start over again. So, uh, And there's a big connection with 12 and, and Israel. All right, now we're going to look at an interesting number in the Bible, the number 13. What's the number 13 associated with? Look in Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. You all got it? Look in verse 4. 12. This is the first time the word 13 shows up in your Bible. Twelve years they served Kedar Lamer. And in the thirteenth year they... What's that word? Rebelled. Thirteen in your Bible is associated with the number of rebellion. So, who showed up there to make the Tower of Babel? It was Nimrod, the 13th generation from Adam, a picture of the Antichrist. That's kind of interesting. Uh, look in Genesis chapter 13, and let's try verse so, uh, 13. The first 13, 13 in your Bible, what do we find? But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. But it's just an alternate lifestyle and we should love them. And what does God have to say about them the first time they show up? <laughs> They're what? Oh, there happens to be 13 words? Uh, it's probably just a coincidence. Uh, it's associated with sodomites. Closest thing you're going to find on this side of human race to the devil right there. Amen. And uh, that's, that's uh, God's way of letting you know something about that number 13. Uh, look in Exodus chapter uh, 13. We'll try chapter 13. And I don't know, let's look at verse, uh, verse 13. And every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. The Bible says man is born as a wild ass's colt. The first one that was born needed to be redeemed. How? How do you need to be redeemed? And if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt what? And all the firstborn of man among thy children shalt thou redeem. There's man and a jackass in the same context of redemption. What was it going to take? It was going to take a lamb. What happens if they don't get redeemed? You break their neck. They're a rebel. Exodus 13 and verse 13. 13 in your Bible is the number of rebellion. Well, let's try Leviticus chapter 13. This might just be a coincidence to see if we can... Oh, what do we find in Leviticus 13? Oh, that's the chapter on leprosy, isn't it? Of all places for God to put the one chapter in the Bible on leprosy, what chapter does He put it in? Well, He puts it in the number 13. Interesting, isn't it? Look in Numbers chapter 13. We'll see if we can break the trend here. In other words, there's some of them that you can just tell, but this one is probably more than any other one in the Bible. God has this thing standing out. I mean, it's sitting out there like a sore thumb and there's a reason for it. There's a reason for it. Genesis chapter 13 because it's going to tell you who the Antichrist is. You put that 13 and that 6 together, you've got your boy. It wasn't any coincidence that 666 was found in verse 18, but it was even a greater non-coincidence that it was found in chapter 13 of the last book in your Bible. That's where you find the number of the beast. It's chapter 13 in verse 18, 666. So whatever you do, watch out for Friday, sixth day of the week, the 13th. You get 6 and 13 together, buddy, you've got problems. You say, what does that mean? I have no idea. But one day we're going to know. The closer we get to the Lord uh, coming back, the closer to the Antichrist, the more that stuff is going to... You're going to see it. 
I don't know if that means something's going to happen on June 13th or if something's going to 6 and uh, 13 some other way with something. I don't know. All I know is there's definitely God is pointing out something there that you can't miss. If you couldn't, if you couldn't spot a bowling ball in a bathtub, uh, listen, you couldn't miss the fact in your Bible that there's definitely something there with the number 13 and the Antichrist and the idea of rebellion in your Bible. Numbers chapter 13, verse 13. I have no idea why this is in the Bible. Or why I unmarked this one. Of the tribe of Asher, Sether, the son of Michael. All right. There's probably a reason why I had that down here, but I have no idea what it is right now. I don't know. That's what I'm saying. There's probably some uh, note I had on that that I don't have here, and so I can't figure out why I had that note. So, never mind. Deuteronomy 13. Let's try that one. Either that or I just got in the hang of doing it and just started doing it for every book of the Bible. I'm not sure. Uh, well, yeah, de definitely Deuteronomy 13, verse 13. Deuteronomy 13 and verse 13. Then, uh, certain men, the children of Belial, are gone up from among you, and have withdrawn inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which ye have not known. So the first time Belial shows up in your Bible, it shows up in Deuteronomy 13 and verse 13. And of course, Belial being a, uh, a, a Baalite type god, a, a, a picture of the devil, and those are the children of the devil. So we find the children of the devil showing up in uh, Deuteronomy 13.13, 13, just as we saw them showing up in Genesis 13, 13. Brother Ray, those weren't children of the devil. Those were the men of Sodom. Hello. Yeah. Uh, figure it out. Yeah. Uh, look in Ezra chapter 2. And let's try verse uh, 13. Ezra 2.13 Y'all got Ezra chapter 2? Alright, look at verse 12. The children of Asgad, 1,220 and 2. The children of Adonikam, 666. The only dude out of all these guys and all these genealogies that shows up with 666 kids and it just happens to be found in verse 13. Now you think of the chances of that. Run a little mouth calculator on that thing and work it out and see what those chances are that that's a coincidence compared with the other one in Revelation and uh, or, or the ones in John. And you'll, you'll get the picture. Amen? You'll get the picture. So, who's the Antichrist? It's Judas Iscariot, the son of perdition. That's who it is. Amen? Uh, Judas Iscariot has how many letters? Thirteen letters in Judas Iscariot. Look in Revelation chapter 17. Revelation 17. What's that? Thirteen words where? In verse 5? Yeah, how about that? Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. All in capital letters. How many words there? Thirteen. Where is that? That's 17.5, right? One, seven, five is... Yeah, the, the, the capitalized words... Mystery, Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. 13. Amen. Now, you may be looking at the number of letters. 
If you take the number of letters, then it's 13 times 5. Uh, 13 times 5 is 65. There's 65 letters in that thing. It's probably all just a coincidence. That's in chapter 17, 1 and 7, verse 5 plus 5 is 8, is 13. 13 is just showing up all over the place, man. And it's connected with Judas Iscariot. See? What was that, Doyle? Yeah. Put the two of those together, you got trouble, man. Amen? What's 5 times 13? 65? Is that what we've said? Uh, I haven't ever studied that number in the Bible. I can't think of anything with 65 in it. How old are you, Gary? No. <laughs> you gave me that look, buddy. All right, uh... Oh, okay, okay. You're taking it another way. All right. Uh, John chapter 6. Say, can you take all this stuff too far? I'm sure you can. You know, you can get ridiculous with it. But listen, when there's just something there, there's something there. You can't you can't miss the thing. Amen. Uh, what's that? Oh, yeah. See, and plus, you're, you're looking for the stuff now. See, it's like I found one. Uh, let me see if I, I might have wrote it down in here. I found one. I'm trying to remember now if I wrote down the verse on that. Oh, um, it was Judges. Uh, hold your place there, John. Look back in Judges, chapter 3. And it was a connection between that 6 and that 13. Where did I say chapter, uh, chapter 3? All right, what do I have down there as a verse? I missed it. No, that was a chapter. But I, there was a verse, and I can't remember what it was now. Um, I have verse 14. 3.14. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Okay, 18 would be 666. All right, I got it. All right, I guess that's the idea there. I guess, I guess that, that's where I was going with that. I don't know what else it could have been. All right. Um, Oh, yeah, he's, he's left-handed, absolutely. He's, he's reigning over Israel. See, that's the idea. Uh, the king of Moab, and it's uh, six, six, six years. Uh, they have to serve him, and then they're, and then they're delivered. All right, um, that, that must have been what that was for. What was the other one I gave you? Now? Oh, John chapter 6. Yeah, look in John chapter 6. Now, this I find interesting. It may mean nothing to you, but... Yeah. Uh, John chapter 6 and verse 66. From that time, many of His disciples went back and walked no more with Him. Now, the Bible says in the last days there will be a falling away first. That man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, an apostasy. You know what will happen at that time? Many of the disciples of the Lord will go back and won't walk anymore with Him. That's, that's the result of apostasy. Amen? Say, so where does that happen? It happens in John chapter 6 and verse 66. Why was it that they fell away? Verse 63. It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray Him. And He said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto Me except it were given unto him of My Father. Now, 
Uh, notice, if you will, verse 70. That would be chapter 6 and verse 70. 6 plus 7 plus 0 is... Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve and one... What's twelve and one, Gary? Thirteen. Have not I chosen you twelve and one of you is a devil? Who's he talking about? Judas Iscariot. You see that thing? That's, that's a wild verse right there. Yeah, and what he said, there's, there's 13 words in All right. Um, just another coincidence. Look in John 13, verse 13. Listen, these are one of those things if you're talking to somebody and it's interesting to them and you can get them involved in reading the Bible through it or something like that, do it. If this is one of those things where somebody says, well, you can't say it. Listen, don't get in an argument with them about biblical numerology. See? Exactly. This is not anything that you want to... you know. If somebody doesn't want to believe in biblical numerology, I'm not going to break fellowship with them over it. It's no great doctrine of faith kind of thing. But what it is, is it's a way to help you when you're studying your Bible to see some things and God to, to show you some things that otherwise you might not see. Uh, John chapter 13 and verse 13, Ye call me Master and Lord. Now, that's in John 13 and verse 13. Master and Lord has how many letters? You say, well, for so I am. There he is. There's the I am. Why does he say that ye call me Master and Lord? Well, he's washing their feet, right? And somebody's getting ready to betray him, right? Look what happens over there in verse 26. That's two thirteens in chapter 13. Chapter 26, or verse 26 of chapter 13. Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. And you see that? Alright, so it's, Satan is just getting ready to betray him. He's washing the feet of the disciples and Judas Iscariot is one of them that's there. And so he says unto them, You call me Master and Lord. You know why the Lord said that? Judas Iscariot never called him Lord. You can't find that one time in your Bible. Whenever Judas Iscariot is talking to Jesus Christ, he calls him Master, but not Lord. Amen? No man can say that Jesus Christ is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. All right, look in Second Chronicles chapter 9. Need to hurry up and finish. I hope I'm not boring you. We'll try and get through this part here real quick. But Second um, Chronicles chapter nine. Let's uh, let's take a look at verse thirteen. Y'all got it. Second Chronicles nine and verse thirteen. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was six hundred three score and six. Talents of gold. 666 came to Solomon in verse 13 of chapter 9. 9 plus 1 plus 3. You know, after a while, it just starts really adding up. But that thing between 13 and 666, man, there's, there is a connection there, buddy. You just can't get over. And, of course, we already looked at the one there in Revelation 13 in verse 18, didn't we? Uh, let's try Proverbs 13. See if we can get any wisdom from Proverbs on this thing. Proverbs chapter 13. Let's, let's look at verse 13. Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed. Why, men? Well, I know who does. The devil does. He despises the Word. And he will be destroyed. Thank God. Um, now, I, I said before, you've got nine is the number of fruitfulness. 
When you take the New Testament books, you've got 27 of them, which is 999. Amen? Now, out of the Old Testament, you don't get that. How does the Old Testament end? Somebody tell me the last three words of the Old Testament. How does it end? Yeah, but what are the last three words of the Old Testament? With a curse. Those are the last three words of the Old Testament. You know how the Old Testament ends? It ends with a curse. So the Old Testament has how many books? 39 books. 13, 13, 13. And so, we got a bunch of guys over here together and we decided to rebel against England. So, we had 13 colonies. And we came up with a flag. And the flag we had uh, had 13 stripes on it. It didn't have any stars at the time, but it had a snake on it with the words, Don't tread on me. 13 letters. And so when you pick up your dollar bill, you're going to see 13 layers to the pyramid and 13 arrows in the eagle's claw and 13 uh, olive branches and just 13s all over the place in that thing. Uh, this nation is here because we rebelled against the establishment. Our rebellion was against the government of man. You understand that? The purpose of our rebellion was man is no good and any kind of government he sets up is no good, so we need to come up with a government that stops man from running man. We need to put in a system of checks and balances so that the government won't get too much control. Say, why do they think that? Well, they, they knew about man. They had a Bible. They knew history. They, they knew what had happened, and every time a government gets in control, it gets greedy and it wants to take over. So they said, let's establish a system so that that won't happen anymore. The one thing they didn't count on is the dumbing down of the American population and the takeover of the news media. So now instead of a, a balance of the checks and balances, you don't have that anymore. You have the fourth estate called the media that is now controlling the country. The news media will tell you who to vote for for president. The news media will tell you who to vote for. Nobody else. You say, well, I have a choice. I could have picked between those three. And how come you couldn't have picked between 300? Because they already decided the three that they could live with. You even figured that out yet? How many right now are running on the Republican nomination ticket? Do you know? Huh? No. There's, there's, uh, there's at least ten. But all you ever hear on the news about is three. Why is that? They want to make sure that at least one of their guys is one of the ones that gets picked. You say, you don't really think there's a conspiracy. Well, maybe I've read a little more than you. You never know. It's possible. You know, I, I may I may have educated myself in that area a little more than you. It's possible. It's possible, though, all you've ever done is watch the television and actually think you're smart. And it's just a possibility, I'm saying. I'm not saying that's so. But if, if that's all you've done is watch the television and you think you know something, <laughs> sorry, I, I hate to be the one to burst your bubble, but uh, that's not where you're going to get information that you can do anything with, let's put it that way. Uh, All righty then. Um, oh, let's do one more real quick before we close for the evening, and that's the number 40. You'll find number 40 in your Bible is the number of trial and testing. Over there in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 12, uh, how long does it rain? 40 days and 40 nights. The number of trial and testing in the Bible. So there in Exodus chapter 24, uh, how many years are they left out there in the wilderness? Forty years, and then and then they got yeah. I'm sorry, and then uh, that's from Numbers 14. How many how many days in Exodus? He's up on the mountain, forty days. Amen. 
Uh, Deuteronomy 25, verse 3. What is that one? You all don't have it yet? <laughs> What's that? Forty stripes. When somebody's punished, you won't go past that. That's the maximum, right? All right, so that's the trial and testing in the, in the Bible. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 2 is where Jesus is tempted of the devil for how long? Forty days and forty nights. It's the number of testing. It's the number of trial. You can't miss that one. Okay? And so Jesus, after His resurrection, stays with His disciples and re- reveals Himself for how many days? Forty days and then He's up. Amen? So uh, once you reach the age of forty, then you can say you know something. Because you've been through some trial. You've been through some testing. Amen? Or for ladies, it would be once you've been married for 40 years. Then, you, yeah. then you've been through some trial. You've been through some testing. Amen. Now, any questions on anything we covered tonight? Anybody get anything out of it? I hope it helped you some. You know, the, the idea... It's... Um, you know, I feel neglect because I'm not like, I don't know, I'm not beating you up on your sins or anything, which you probably need, but, you know, it's just information. And so you don't want, I'm always worried when all I'm doing is giving information because you don't want that to be everything in Christianity where it's just knowledge, where it's just information. You obviously it wants to work in your heart and do something for your whole being. But like I said, if you'll just take this, if nothing else, and just, if it will increase your faith in that book, if it will help you fall in love with that book a little bit more and realize uh, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God doth man live. If you want life, uh, if you want to be clean, if you want health, if you want strength, you'll, you'll find it in the pages of Holy Scripture. We have the opportunity, like many of our forefathers, our brethren from years and years ago didn't have the opportunity of. You know, they only came out with the printing press in the uh, late 1500s. So the opportunity for people to get Bibles has really only been around for about uh, you know, 450 years. Think about that. And we have one. And there was, over, there was a period over a thousand years where Christians, when they got the Bible, they may have gotten the book of John or the book of Romans or a little bit here and there, and they had some churches where maybe there was a pastor that had a Bible that actually loved the Lord and helped those people, but you didn't have what we have now. We have an opportunity like uh, no one else ever. And the devil knows that. That's why all these new Bibles are out. He knows what he's doing. Uh, Listen, the Catholic Church for, for centuries, when men would try to make copies of Bibles and put them out and publish them, would have the men uh, tortured and killed, and the Bibles confiscated and burned. You ever heard of Tyndale? You ever heard of Wycliffe? John Huss? Uh, that's what's going on there, see? But finally, you know what happened, buddy? After after Luther got got out there and then they started getting them printing presses all over France and Germany and, up, and then up into England and all of a sudden all them Bibles started to be printed out and the Catholic Church couldn't destroy them quick enough and couldn't arrest everybody quick enough and they knew they were in trouble. You know what the Catholic Church did? They had to come up with a different plan of attack. You know what they did? They came up with the Dewey Reams version of 1582. Because they knew we can't stop this thing from coming out. The only thing we can do is make a diversion and take the Bible and mess it all up so bad that they won't trust this one and they won't trust that one. They won't know what to believe and therefore they won't have a sound. That didn't happen until right before the King James Bible came out. The devil knows what he's doing. Catholic Church never made a Bible available to anybody ever and never would have. It wasn't for the fact that we were doing it so they didn't want to look too bad. That's all that was. See? And so the, you, can, you can see the devil, how he, how he figures that stuff. He, he's smart, man. Smarter than any man. He's looking down there and he looks at that and he sees, before you know it, everybody's going to be starting to get a Bible in their own language and, oh man, they might have a Bible or something. I don't want to see that happen. So we can't arrest them quick enough. We can't kill them. Let's do this. Boom. What did he do? He came out with another Bible, with another version. The first up-to-date new version and all that was the Dewey Reims version. And it was the Roman Catholic Church, and it was their desire to do that. Amen. 
You take Roman Catholic Church doctrines and look how the King James Bible just disables every one of them. Then you compare all your new Bibles. And you're going to find out that all those verses where the King James Bible just totally shows you what the Roman Catholic Church is all about, they water all those verses down. Uh, somebody's out to protect their bride. Thank God the Lord's protecting us. But the devil's got his bride too. Amen. And he's got his Bible. Episcopal Church, Church of England. Yep. Yep. And then you'll see all that. You study the workings and history of that, of, of after that with the Jesuits and everything the Catholic Church did to try and get England back, including the Spanish Armada, which just was sunk by a storm getting ready to take over England just before the King James Bibles were to be printed. See? There's all kinds of stuff going on back there with all that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you look at what they did there with uh, Mary. Uh, was it Mary? Bloody Mary? See, they got a Catholic queen in there and took over and she started taking uh, guys like Tyndale and all them and having them arrested and imprisoned and to try and get rid of the... Uh, and then you had a great man come along by the name of... Uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, that's killing me now. It was right there on the tip of my tongue and I just drew a total blank. The great uh, English uh, warrior... Oh, it was there again and it left again. Oh, my goodness. Lord, help me. No. It wasn't Winston Churchill, thank God. It was a real man. Um, no, it's back in the 1500s. Um, he's the one that came in. He never lost a battle. Ever. No, he was the... They didn't have a king in England at the time. Thank you. Good night, nurse. Man, I don't know why that name just wouldn't come to me. Oliver Cromwell. Great, great man. And uh, saved. The guy was saved. And uh, he was. He basically said, we don't want Catholics in here anymore and look what they've done to our country and everything. And buddy, God used that. He used that thing right there because without that darkness in there, the, England was a... Because it was an island nation, God worked that thing out where now he had a country that he could use. So when he brought that King James, so why is it England? Hey man, that was it. There wasn't no America at the time. God wasn't going to wait until America to get a Bible together. As soon as them printing presses came out, there it came. You know, And he did it under a King James who happened to be a biblical name and, and used that Bible as the one that he blessed and made sure that his word went out through the ends of the earth. What happened after the King James Bible came out? England got right with God, man. England was on fire and revivals in Scottish and Wales and Germany. And what are they all doing? They're going all over this globe putting out the gospel of Christ. At the same time, the Catholics are saying, oh, no, they're doing that. We've got to stop them. So that's why you got your French and your Spanish uh, places that were settled at the same time. Everybody was out for their chunk of the pie, as it were. But everywhere that England went, Christianity flourished. And all those areas that England was in, those are the countries that did the best. You know, places where Spain and France came in didn't do as good because it was Catholic domination. So they left their idolatry and everything else, and they, they were all third world nations. Right. Sure. That's that's the result of that stuff. So. Yeah. Well, Africa has more raw resources than anywhere. Huh. Talk about a waste. <laughs> You know, I mean, you want to talk about fertile land for farming? You want to talk about uh, uh, diamonds and gold and all that stuff that's in, man, it's just for Indonesia is another one. I mean, that place is loaded with all that stuff. And they just, like the Lord put it in all the places. I don't know. I was just reading, what was I reading? Um, I'm doing my Bible reading this morning, and I'd seen it before, and I kind of like forgot about it. 
But I read over it again and I said, there's got to be something to that thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I need to do a study on that over there in Israel and find out what's going on. But God said He sent, He hid uh, riches under the sand. Where was that thing at? That was at the end of Numbers, I think. Um, well, yeah, exactly. There, I got it. I got it. Um, look at Numbers 34. I think. Let me see. Maybe that's not it. No, that's not it. That's not it. Or wait a minute. No, I, I finished Deuteronomy. Look at this. See if there's anything there where he's talking about the different tribes. Um, well, I did make it up into about halfway through Joshua this morning, so I'm pretty sure it was re something I was reading this morning. Oh, good night, Ryan. Go get me my concordance. I hate when I have to give in to my concordance. What's your best memory of what the verse said? Uh, it was. Uh, it was. I think it was talking about Naphtali or one of the tribes. Uh, and it says there was uh, riches. He had put riches under the sand. Or something like that. I'm going to kick myself when I find it, too. I'm going to be like, what, am I, what was I thinking? All right, here we go. Oh, there it is. Deuteronomy 33. Okay. Good night, sister. Tell Kenny we said hi. Deuteronomy 33. Well, I was close looking at it there too and I didn't see it. Okay, that's it. Notice what the Lord's doing here in, in Deuteronomy 33 is the blessings to each of the tribes. All right? Verse uh, 6, let Reuben live and not die. Verse 7, the blessing of Judah. See, uh, um, going down through there, uh, uh, verse 12, Benjamin. Verse 13, Joseph. See that thing? Um, verse 18. Look at verse 18. Zebulun. And of Zebulun, he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tents. They shall call the people unto the mountain. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness. For they shall suck of the abundance of the seas and of treasures hid in the sand. Now, for me, that's oil, man. There ain't no doubt about that thing at all. So, I don't know if they've found that oil yet or not, but I bet you they're gonna. Wouldn't that be something? Yeah, but that's talking about that area right there out, out, out from where Zebulun and, and Issachar are. So, the idea is to look at that geographically and then find out what's going on in Israel right now and see if they do have oil drilling going on there or plans for it. That's my. St that's what I want to study and try and find out. Yeah, that could be a cause of a lot of things, couldn't it? Because all of a sudden, if Israel had plenty of oil to spit out and that you didn't need Arabia's oil anymore, oh my, 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 my. That's why I was looking at that thing. I was like, huh. You know, the Lord has some wild verses just kind of sticks in, in Deuteronomy 33. You know, it's, it's amazing how He does that in the Bible. He just... He's got these little nuggets kind of just dispersed all over the place. <laughs> kind of like in the sand of the sea. 
<laughs> you just got to keep looking. You'll find them. Yeah. Yeah, they wouldn't even know when it was. So he just says, you know, riches in the in the sea, in the sand. Yeah. <laughs> what I can do with this? Nothing. Yeah. Amen. All right, Doyle, you want to close us in prayer, please?